Hello to all of our attendees. I'm Andrew Rudasevich, Market, Marketing Relations Manager for CMB Regional Centers. A very warm welcome to all of you that were able to join us. It's truly our pleasure to have you here today. We're delighted to present today's exciting topic, America's EB-5 program and the great pause. Our hope is today that you'll find tremendous value in our discussions and the presentations today. The information that's going to be shared today is for educational purposes. It's not meant to be taken as sales, legal, or directed advice. <clears throat> Following today's presentations, we'll look forward to an interactive Q&A session. We'll do our best to accommodate as many questions as time allows. And today will be <clears throat> Uh, an event where we have already received a few questions ahead of time. Uh, we'll be addressing those questions first, but please use the command down below in the, in the interactive panel uh, to continue to ask questions as today's event uh, progresses. If there's any questions that are individually or very specifically related to your situation, uh, please feel free to reach out to CMB directly. We'll try to address those questions outside of today's event. And as one last reminder, we're going to be leaving your audio muted for the entirety of today's event. During our event today, we'll have a moderator. Our moderator today is going to be Miss Sophia Zhang. Works with CMB Swiss Co. Sophia? Yes. Would you like to take it away, please? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for my uh, for the, for your introduction. Uh, I just just add some uh, add something briefly. I work I I'm, I work for CMB Spisco and uh, based in Hong Kong. I'm helping our uh, investors and uh, referral partners across Hong Kong, Singapore, and Indonesia. Um, Now, please allow me to to introduce our great our great panelist today. Our first our first uh, panelist here is uh, Mr. Nada Dur Kumar. Uh, Mr. Kumar is a U.S. immigration attorney. Uh, Kumar immigrated to U.S. from from India 30 years ago, and uh, Mr. Kumar uh, has has a master degree from University of Minnesota and UCLA. Mr. Kumar also acquired a law degree from Loyola Marymount University. Uh, Mr. Kumar is extensively involved in the pro bono work uh, and also other legal services for South Asian organizations. Mr. Kumar is a founding member, CEO, and general counsel of the Hindu Temple Society of Southern California. Uh, Mr. Kumar, I know you're based in LA, so this is like a super early morning for you. Thank you for being here on a such early morning and welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My greetings to all of you from the sunny Southern California. The sun has not still come out here. I'm just here to talk to you specifically about the EB-5 program, particularly in the context of the recent decisions and lapse of the program, where do we stand exactly is the question that I'm going to address today. But before I do that, just to add to the disclaimer, since I'm an attorney, nothing I say today must be construed as legal advice to anyone, notwithstanding with about three decades of practicing law, I will address some of these issues very specifically. So just by way of introduction quickly, everyone throughout the world is concerned about the flux and the fluidity caused by some recent events. Primarily, everyone is concerned about those people who really are aspiring to enter into the EB-5 program based on regional center, those who already applied and those who never applied. So 
So we will specifically address each of these segments. And beyond that, I will simply answer questions. Because of time constraints, I will remain as brief as I can. So I would like Sophia to start addressing the questions to me, if she has any. Um, Mr. Kumar, we will go back. We will go to the questions after I, I introduce all the panelists here. Is that okay, okay. by you? Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Should I go ahead and continue my comments? Um, if you have any further comments, for sure. Yeah, you can you can continue on it. No, I'll pause right now. Let me allow yes. you to introduce other panelists. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back to, to you later then. Thank you. So our uh our second our second panelist here is Mr. Kai Boyle. Mr. Um Kai joined CMB in 2010, and he has been working for CMB for over 10 years. And Kai has 30 years experience, uh, 30 years of uh, economic development experience over his uh, over his uh, decade long working at CMB and EB5 industry. Kai has been a frequent speaker, presenter, and a panelist in various EB5 conferences and events. Kai, it's also early for you. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here, and uh, hello to all of our, our our participants around the world and fellow panelists. Thanks for being here. I think it's a it's an incredible opportunity to share some of the information that, and some answer some of the questions that are on everyone's mind. So thanks for uh, for being a part of it, and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing that uh, information that we have for our t for our um, for our attendees today. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. And uh, our our third distinguished guest here is Mr. Kyler James, uh, Chief Economist and the Director of Government Affairs at CMB Regional Centers. Kyler has been with CMB for more than nine years, and uh, Kyler has a master degree in economics and Russian studies from University of South California and University of Oregon, respectively. Uh, Mr. James, Mr. J joined CMB more than nine years ago and has built an experience based on working directly with clients, borrowers, EB-5 stakeholder organizations, and lawmakers. Kyler works to ensure that our CMB offerings are compliant with EB-5 requirements, as well as monitoring the changing landscape of the EB-5 requirements. Kyler, I know you're going to bring us the most up to up-to-date information about the status of the program and uh, also all the efforts behind scenes to reauthorize and extend the program. Yes, looking forward to a, a great discussion. Thank you very much, Sophia, and to, to all of our panelists. Uh, of course, uh, you, you mentioned most up-to-date. Uh, we're in a very changing environment. So I'll, I'll keep my Twitter feed open and, and uh, try and keep us as up-to-date as we can. Thanks. And uh, our our four our first distinguished guest here is a special guest, and uh, his name is uh, Jake Park. Uh, Mr. Mr. Jake Park is a loan compliance associate as a, uh, at CMB Regional Centers. As a as part of the CMB uh, loan compliance efforts, Mr. Park is uh, responsible for tracking the status of CMB loan portfolios and assisting CMB borrowers to meet various benchmarks and ensuring project schedules are in compliance and in accordance to the legal documents. Uh, Jake acquired a master degree in taxation from the State University of, uh, of New York. And he, has a, he also holds a bachelor degree in accounting from, uh, from, from the same university. Uh, Jake, Jake, uh, Jake is originally from Korea, and uh, he spent 11 years in Indonesia. So Jake can speak fluent in Bahasa Indonesian and Korean and English. Welcome, Jake. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you for all the panelists and attendees. Looking forward for a great discussion. Thanks. Uh, so now we uh, go we, now we go directly to the questions. Um, first of all, 
Kyler, I'd like to ask you a question that it probably is on every EB-5 investor and prospective family's mind. So you have been working, we know you have been working closely with the stakeholders and uh, decision makers in Washington, D.C., uh, trying to get the EB-5 program reauthorized and uh, extended. So what can you tell us about those efforts to reauthorize the EB-5 program? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'm glad that we're having this meeting today rather than two or three days ago. Uh, two or three days ago, I'd be talking about the, the promise of a bill that's upcoming, right? Uh, the, the, the hopeful introduction of a bill soon enough. Uh, what I can tell you today is that uh, there, there is an industry consensus right now around a, a bill. That language has been drafted. It's, it's being, uh, we'll say, uh, courted to lawmakers at this point. We're, we're in their offices, having those discussions, trying to, to, to work with them, bring them on board. Uh, right now, the, the industry consensus bill, uh, it's, it's far, from, uh, far from finalized, uh, but we do have language that exists. We are working our way through it. Right now, uh, at, at the request of all participating, including those lawmakers, uh, it's not something that's being uh, widely disseminated, widely dispersed. Uh, rather, uh, the conversations are ongoing. Uh, the hope is to have uh, continued support of the bill, continued support of uh, an extension to the EB-5 program in some form, uh, in, in short order. Uh, really, really uh, working on that right now um, in those congressional offices on a daily basis, working towards uh, exactly what you know, what all of the questions that, that of course we'll be talking about today, the, the, the what are the dollar figures, what, what's gonna qualify as a TEA, or, or for that matter, will TEAs exist? All these, all these questions, all those discussions of, uh, frankly, six years of, of, uh, of effort to get an EB-5 program uh, that, that has uh, important integrity improvements to the program, uh, a level playing field for all of those of us involved, uh, as well as all of those, uh, you know, th th those of our attendees, those attorneys, those uh, participants in the EB-5 program all have a level playing field, all have a way of moving forward. Uh, don't end up in a, in a never ending line, frankly. So that, that, that's a big part of it. Um, and, and Sophia, I'll, I'll, uh, if you'd like, I can go into more detail, but I'll, I'll leave it with that for now. Um, sure. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're really happy to hear that there is a consensus within the industry and we can present something to the lawmakers to, 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 to review and uh, consider. Um, so just a little more detailed, one little more detailed question, I think everyone, every, in everyone's mind. So what, it, what would be the investment minimum investment amount in the consensus bill at the moment? She goes right to the heart on that one. Doesn't sure. She? No, ab absolutely. <laughs> what's what's one of the first questions we're asked by any investors is is how does this compare to anywhere else in the world? What's what what's my out of pocket, right? Um, Correct. Yeah. So so certainly that that's a, a great question. Uh, right now, the bill talks about uh, sort of the non TEA amount uh, somewhere around eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, with the TEA amount being uh, seven hundred thousand um, dollars. And, and that's the bare investment. There are uh, added fees to the improved integrity of the program, to the monitoring of the program uh, by USCIS. But the the base amount, that investment amount, is a seven hundred thousand uh, dollar figure for the time being. Uh, and that number has fluctuated. Uh, really, what we've seen, uh, sort of real world, is is that five hundred thousand uh, dollars from Congress and and from uh, those that oversee the program. That, that's that's a true floor. There, there's no way the dollar figure will ever go below that. Uh, we, we saw incredible participation in the program. We, we, we see ourselves compared to other countries very favorably, uh, if not at a discount at $500,000. Uh, but what we've also seen was $900,000 was was hard for a lot of investors. The, the participation reduced dramatically uh, under the $900,000 figure. So we we saw ourselves with with sort of floor and ceiling. Uh, what we've been negotiating now is is something between the two. And, and what we've settled on, uh, like I say, for the time being, uh, given given and 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 gotten industry consensus on, uh, is this seven hundred thousand dollar figure for a 
uh, TEA investment. Well, thanks, Kyler. I know I, I said one, but I have a, a oh, attached. Please, to please don't stop. Yes. <laughs> So, so you mentioned that uh, we 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 already we kind of touched the the selling price and the floor price, and we also know that uh, you know there's a lawsuit, uh, and and also U.S. has appealed the outcome of the lawsuit. So and so now we know that there is a middle 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 price that is in discussion, and so what's your take? What's the likelihood we, we still have a floor price upon renewal? Or what do you think is the most likely scenario? What, what price the investor should look at if they're considering EV5 at the moment? Sure, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, if I thought you got to the heart of the matter before. Um, no, so the lawsuit, there's an interesting thing um, here where, where we have uh, different pressures, different forces working in in different angles that will get to the same conclusion, hopefully. Uh, if we let the lawsuit play out, obviously that will come to a dollar amount. That will uh, either tell us 500,000 or, or 900,000. There's not, there's not an in-between, right? There's not a negotiation in this lawsuit. Uh, either USCIS uh, properly went through the procedures to, to come to $900,000 and that's what we get, or they didn't and 500,000 is what we get. The, the problem with that lawsuit is it assumes that a program exists. So without congressional uh, approval, without congressional progress and movement in creating a new EB-5 law or a renewal of the old EB-5 law, then, then there's a moot point. The, the lawsuit uh, doesn't, doesn't matter, frankly. Um, so what, what we find is, is congressional offices now really looking to set a new dollar amount. If con Congress comes back and says, you know what, too much negotiation, it's not getting anywhere, we want the program back in whatever form, they can do a, a simple renewal of the program. That simple renewal of the program would put it at $500,000 and allow the lawsuit to move forward. If we're being really honest, that, that there's a, there is a chance, I, I won't say that there's not, but that chance is, is relatively small. That, that chance is not the that, that's not where I would put my, uh, my, my betting money if I was a betting man. Uh, so $500,000, again, there, there's a chance that that's what we find ourselves with. Uh, but in all likelihood, uh, Congress seems uh, more inclined to act right now than they have in the past. Uh, industry seems more inclined to act right now than they have in the past. If they're able to do that, the, the bill that we have right now sets a new dollar amount. As soon as the, the bill sets a new dollar amount and becomes law, then the entirety of the, the bearing lawsuit becomes a moot point. The, the dollar amount that they are arguing over doesn't, doesn't play in, take into effect, take into effect the, the fact that there's a new dollar amount. So that the bearing lawsuit just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to reset the dollar amounts to 900 or to 500. Uh, as Congress has then acted uh, of, above and created a new law that says $700,000 or again, whatever that figure ends up being negotiated out to. So if I were a betting man, I would be looking at $700,000 right now. I well, wanna, thanks, I've, I've, got a, I've got a question for you, Kyler. You're, you've been working very closely with that. Um, the the regula regulations that, that have um, been stopped by the bearing lawsuit included indexing for uh, increase investment amount. Has that been included in the the uh, the legislative language? I, yes. So so it does exist in the legislative language as as addressed. Uh, um, not exactly the same as the the bearing lawsuit, or, or rather, not exactly the same as as the USCIS regulations, uh, but quite similar. Uh, what we'd see is. Uh, Beginning after, I, I believe it's two years after enactment, uh, you'd find the first adjustment, and that's just adjusted uh, based on a, a sort of standard uh, inflation factor, uh, and, and then rounded to the ten thousand dollar figure. You know, getting too far into the weeds, but yes, it's it's inflated uh, after two years, I believe, and then every three years after that, uh, just brought up to uh, to essentially counter what we what we're seeing right now. Uh, to move from 500 to 900 in a day 
was was very difficult. I believe that had we uh, had we seen occasional increases from 500 up to 900 or 700 or whatever that figure might be, uh, that that would have been an easier process, an, e an easier adjustment over the 20 years rather than trying to, or, or nearly 30 years at this point, uh, rather than trying to adjust for inflation one time after a 30 year gap in, in adjusting for inflation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kyler. And I want to sign a, a reminder for all the audience. This is supposed to be a live discussion. So if you have any questions, you can leave your questions uh, by clicking the Q&A button. And uh, we do have two questions so far from the audience. The first question, I think, Kyler, this is also for you. When do we expect the industry bill to pass? Oh, sure. Yeah. And that, that um, absolutely and a, a critical part of this. What we're finding right now is we're already into, uh, frankly, the last half of September. Uh, the, the, the last half of September is very difficult. What we, what we find right now is Congress dealing with other very large issues. Frankly, they, they need to fund a federal government. That's, as you expect, a, a uh, Herculean effort is what we've found over the last six years that we've been involved in this and, and, and many years prior to that. Uh, just to fund the federal budget becomes a, a negotiating point, becomes a weeks long effort to try to come up with the correct bill, the correct appropriations to different sectors, to different uh, programs, the renewal of various programs. EB-5 has been being renewed for six years in at this point uh, for short term renewals. Prior to that, it was you know two to five year renewals were a common uh, a commonality. What we've seen over the last six years, rather, is never a single full year extension, but two months, three months, eight months, five days, uh, you know, very short term renewals uh, that have hampered the program. Uh, so we're really looking forward to a longer term renewal. The reason I bring this up is the end of September is coming quickly. Uh, lawmakers and the negotiators in the room have largely been saying, we're not gonna get there by September. On a federal budget level, we're not gonna get there by the end of September. We need a two week extension or a three year or a four. You know, we need some sort of, of short term extension. Uh, they, they refer to that as a continuing resolution. That just says, just, just we'll continue the funding as it was appropriated last year for one extra month. Uh, continue to, open, to keep those programs open. Unfortunately, in the past, that continue to keep the programs open included EB-5. EB-5 was, a, was, a, was sunsetting with uh, the, the budget, was sunsetting with the other programs at the end of September, the end of that fiscal year. What we have now is, is a program that is already sunset, a program that doesn't simply need kicked down the road, if you will, but needs a, a true renewal, a, a true reauthorization, a, a true revitalization. Um, so very unlikely, that's why when we talk about the 500,000, very unlikely that we find ourselves at the end of September getting brought back to life, getting, getting reauthorized. Uh, rather, we'll see a two-week extension of the other federal programs and of the federal budget with EB-5 being kept off to the side. And then in mid-October uh, is, is kind of the date that everybody's looking at right now, mid to late October of getting a larger appropriations bill uh, or a larger longer term extension of the federal budget uh, and a and a reauthorization of this EB-5 program. That's where this bill uh, hopes to sit in all of this. Well, thanks. Hopefully we can we can we can see that happen by mid October. Yep. And and, and I, I think timing wise, obviously, everybody's got their hands very busy, very, uh, very full at this point. But uh, we are having good, good, good discussions. We're, uh, I won't say where we, where we want to be. Where we want to be is, is six years ago, uh, getting, getting a, uh, improved integrity measures. But we'll call, we'll take this as a plan B. Thanks, Skylar. Uh, all 
our second question is uh, towards CMB, but I think we can we can invite the insights from Mr. Kumar. Uh, the question is, uh, can you please share CMB's figures regarding the latest I-829 application adjudications since July 2021? And also, based on CMB's experience, which ones are real US CIS criteria for uh, I-829 adjudications? So Kai, would you like to uh, share some insights on our record before um, I give the floor to Mr. Kumar? Yes, and in talking about IA29 consideration, um, you know, we happen to have our chief economist who who does all the numbers crunching and as far as job creation, um, because that's an important key when when it comes to. Uh, an investor filing their IA-29 that has gotten through the process far enough to get to the IA-29 uh, to file that. And what I can say, and, and I've got Kyler here to back me up, that no investor that has filed an IA-29 in a CMB partnership fails to file with, with sufficient jobs. There's always sufficient jobs for every investor to qualify for an IA-29 approval based upon job creation uh, when they file that IA-29. So, all of our all of our partnerships that have an IE29 filed, as long as they've been adjudicated, uh, they investors have qualified for approval. And and uh, if they've been if the investor's petition has been approved or adjudicated, then it's been approved. Yeah, I'll I'll throw in my two cents. Absolutely, Kai. That's uh, a great point. Is is uh, I, I do have my hands very very thoroughly involved with the i829 processing with with preparing the petitions that our investors use uh we do continue to see success more more uh to the point of since july 2021 uh we we do continue to see adjudications uh, uscis obviously put in advance all of the new 526s but they do continue to process uh other petitions and we we have seen those process um you know i i wouldn't say that we've we've seen a significant uptick. Uh, it would be great to see them saying, hey, we don't have all these 526s. Let's shift all of our efforts. Uh, I, I won't say that we've seen a significant uptick, but we have seen them continue to process petitions. And, and as Kai said, uh, you know, from CMB's perspective, uh, I'll, I'll put it maybe a little more bluntly. The only time we've ever seen our investors fail is if they've lied to us and the USCIS. Uh, thanks, Skylar, uh, for your inputs. And uh, Mr. Kumar, would you like to share your insights from uh, immigration attorney perspective regarding this question? First of all, <clears throat> let me simply may address, make some comments about various people who spoke today. And one of the first things I want to share with you is the fact that the legislative process is always a tough one in the US as it is in many other countries. So in the last minute, many things get passed. So I'm optimistic, I share the optimism, this program is going to continue. I have no doubt about it. And the other panelists have addressed the amounts involved and so on. So I'm going to take a more pragmatic approach and look at what we got to do at this time, purely from the perspective of the people who are listening to this in the following sense. Where do I stand if I already filed my application form? If I invested already? All of this is on a timeline. The first issue is those people who actually invested $900,000 and whose applications are still pending. And those people who applied for a short period of seven or eight days after the Bahrain decision, who invested $500,000, it's a small number, and those who never invested so far. So if you really look at people and look at the processing on the part of the immigration, it's my belief that more or less the applications pertaining to the initial approval, the conditional approval, approve, I mean, the approval with conditional green card, all that is currently being held up so that there is no resolution to that right now on a short-term basis. 
So the way I would like to describe it is that all of these categories in some way or the other are impacted by everything that is happening in the Congress. In what, what do I, how do I make decisions right now? If I were sitting in Singapore, if I were sitting in Indonesia, how do I make some decisions right now as to where I go from here? Those who have applied for it, you are literally in a state of suspended animation, the legislation, for lack of a better expression. So all that it means is that your application will be honored at some point or the other. And this pause that way, if it is only if, uh, literally to the pause, it won't last long. Those people who invested $500,000, in all likelihood, it's my own conclusion, that in some form or the other, their application will be adjudicated, either with asking them to make some additional investments, whatever the legislation ends up with. And those who have not filed at all, certainly you have to wait, hopefully for a short period, and we'll get resolution on all these matters. So when you are making a decision, keep in your mind, there is optimism, there is temporary pauses. All of this will play out within the next couple of months. I would like to make a few comments about the varying decision because many people never expected this. And whatever has happened in the court in simple language is merely a technicality. It's not a substantive issue based on which this program amount went back to $500,000. So the technicality is being at the present time put in the legal process. I don't believe at a pragmatic level that that is going to be the way this whole program will be decided. I agree with Kailas that it's going to become moot at some point of time. And if you look at the motivation of the Congress, this country has gone through a tough period like many of the other countries in terms of the pandemic, economic downturn, loss of employment. So if you look at the very purpose of the EB-5 program, it was geared toward really increasing employment in the US. Given that, Congress is very motivated right now. I think we are looking for very, very good days to come. This program will be alive and well. And as Skylar said, the amount will settle somewhere between 500 and 900 probably, because they also have competing needs. On the one hand, they want to increase the number of people, the pool of people who invest. And on the other hand, they also want to raise enough funds. So if you look at all of these factors, I think we are heading in the right direction. And those people who have already invested don't have to be concerned of either losing entirely the ability to get the green card. I don't expect that to happen at all. Uh, Mr. Kumar, we have a question from, from the attendees uh, for you. Uh, Mr. Kumar, if for any reason we can't get the program reauthorized anytime soon, will the USS start to deny everyone's I-526 petitions? This is all, again, must be viewed very practically. I don't see that happening. Why do I not expect to see that happening? You know, I concede that at the end of the day, we are dealing with the bureaucracy for reasons that I already explained, if a large number of 485s are denied, it literally renders the entire program itself in a state of confusion. Congress as moving as they are, as, it, as a, thank you. So Congress as fluid as they may be, they're fully aware of the circumstances that surrounded themselves with. So if you truly ask me, is there a possibility that the 485s could get denied? Perhaps, you know, but it's very low. And even if it is, there'll be some alternate means that will be created through the regulatory process to accommodate these people at some level. So I don't think I'm concerned about denial of the 485s and other applications or immigrant visa petitions abroad. 
That's why this session is called as the Great Pause. It is a pause. It is not going to, to, to end this program at any level or to disrupt people who have already invested. So I'm quite comfortable in making a projection like they do in elections. I think we are looking more optimistically for a greater outcome for all of you. Thank uh, you, Kumar, I think. If I can just add okay, to that, Sophia, I, I think there's a reason that they're being held in abeyance right now. There, there's a light at the end of the tunnel that says reauthorization, that the program will come back. And I believe that as long as Congress doesn't entirely switch that light off and say, nope, we're not negotiating, we're not doing anything, the program is dead and will never come back. I believe that's the only way that we'll see I-526 petitions being denied. Otherwise, they will continue to hold them in abeyance, continue to hope for that light at the end of the tunnel, that, that the program will come back, that we will be able to renew uh, the adjudication of those petitions. I, I believe that's, if I were in USCIS offices right now, I think that's what they're saying is, let's, let's see how this plays out. Uh, and as, as Kumar properly stated, this, this, this is the great pause. That, that's where we're all at right now is everything's being put on hold or largely everything's being put on hold while we, while we negotiate a renewal of a program, while we, re, we negotiate uh, the, the improvements to, and frankly, that's the way we, we should be talking about it is the improvements to the EB-5 program that, that need to be done. Thank you, Kyler, and thank you, Kumar. That's really uh, relieving projections and inputs from you both, thanks. Um, we have a big question. Actually, we received prior this webinar and now we're receiving it from our chat box again. So in the markets, we have, we have been seeing a big push for direct EB-5 investment. So I think this question is for all the panelists here. So can you provide some thoughts on this uh, direct uh, EB-5 offering idea? Uh, do you think the direct investment is a big news or big problems for the prospective families? We, if I may address that question, I personally think historically, this direct investment has posed a lot of problems to people. And the reason is that it all comes with the ability to create 10 jobs. But if you're talking about even targeted areas, the amount is, is 500,000, but regardless, this generation of employment for a two year period has caused issues at multiple levels. First of all, they have been leaving this two year continuous employment in somewhat of a flux again, with no ability on the part of the immigration to make quick decisions, just like everything else cases have been pending for a long time. And given what has been ha happening in the economy, a lot of direct investors also took a hit. How do you create 10 jobs when you descend, depend entirely on the, on the economic factors? So I truly believe not surprisingly, the direct investment has been only a small part of the EB-5 program. It has never been a dominant part. If I remember statistically, almost 90, 95% of the people really obtain their green cards through regional centers. So I, it's my opinion that regional centers are the centerpiece. The direct investments may go up because the, the reopening of the economy might create in the short term some demand for people to get excited and invest money. But largely, I believe regional centers will continue to stay as the centerpiece of the EB-5 program. I happen to agree with that. And Kyler, um, yeah, I think you may and I may be on the same path. The fact that the, the direct EB-5 is not something new. And as Kumar pointed out, that it's, it's been around and it's, it's been a small part and there's reasons behind that. The job creation, is based upon operations of a business. And we are in an environment where even some of the, the long-term businesses that have been established for many, many years 
have not been able to get through the COVID-19 shutdowns and all of the impacts that were caused by COVID-19 to the economy. That's not going to be any different just because you're doing an immigration pursuit on a direct EB-5 and it, it looks like a, a fine project or a fine business to invest in. That's going to continue to be the case until we, well, I think for probably the foreseeable future. Uh, the other point of that is, is that the, the immigration pursuit, when, when one runs a business, typically they, run, they operate and they invest in a business for a return. They want a, to maximize their return on their investment. And when you combine that motive, but you distract it with the fact that you've now based it on an immigration goal rather than a return on investment goal, there are times when those goals are in direct conflict with one another. Uh, Attorney Kumar mentioned the fact that if it's in a TEA, that it's one investment amount. Well, you're going to have the United States government tell you where you should put your business to, to a, so that you can invest only 500000 You're also going to have to do a lot of reporting. There's a lot of paperwork because that's the immigration side of things. However, there, there are times when a profitable business could happen with maybe six full-time employees and maybe eight part-time employees. That's a profitable business. You've got a manager and a, and a daytime manager and a nighttime manager and, a, and a, some other full-time employees. But the majority of the, of the businesses that operate in the United States today uh, that are of that, that small million dollar investment type, they, they operate on many more part-time employees, people who are, have a, either a second job or it's a mom working uh, during the children's school day or some other uh, off hours type work to pick up a few extra dollars for uh, whatever the family needs are, but it, it is not to hire 10 people, pay them benefits, pay all of the uh, requirements that, that the law requires in whatever state that they happen to be. It's a very, very difficult contrast to, to match up in the immigration and, and the for-profit motive, to which I, I recommend uh, to people that if you want to run a business, run a business. You're probably very good at running your business. Run it as a business and make the business decisions based upon the business need rather than on the immigration need. So if you want to do immigration with your investment, you know, CMB is really good at that. Do both. Do, do one for immigration and the other one to run your business as a business. Kyler? Uh, yeah, I, I will uh, attest to what's been said and I'll, I'll actually focus my answers a little bit on, on two things. Uh, one is sort of this short term, we don't have the ability to do indirect right now. Uh, does that make direct more appealing? Does that make it better, right? Well, it, it is the only option available right now, but I, I, would, I would urge you not to look quite so short-sightedly uh, that, that again, there's optimism throughout the industry. There's consensus throughout the industry, uh, both industry-wide as well as uh, in congressional offices that, that we can get a program back, that we can get an indirect uh, regional center option back up and running. Uh, just because it's the only, the, the, you know, you, you go to a pet store and it's the only dog available doesn't mean it's a good dog, right? We, we, we really need to look at our options, look a little bit more long-term, uh, just like, just like uh, adopting a pet is, is a long-term, years-long decision. So is this. Uh, don't find yourself saying, well, it's, it's a reduced in mount, right? It, it's, it's, it's it's the only uh, the only opportunity that's out there today. It is today. It's the only opportunity that's out there. That doesn't make it a better option. Uh, as uh, Attorney Kumar, as, as Mr. Boyle have, have mentioned, that there are real real risks with the direct investment option. Uh, the other question uh, is how does this play into legislation? Right. We talk a lot about legislation having to renew. Uh, the regional center program. This legislation would also be impactful on the direct EB-5 investment. That, that $500,000 would also increase to, uh, again, that negotiated point of $700,000 right now. Uh, we, we would see a, an increase in those investment amounts as well. Um, if, if you, in your, in your heart of hearts, if you believe that you can successfully manage a business and can successfully turn that into a green card opportunity, 
that 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 can be successful. People do succeed in EB five as direct EB five investors. The percentages don't don't lie though. The statistics don't lie. It is a it is a harder thing to do. Uh, it is a very select few uh, that do take the direct EB five investment amount. Uh, so I, I would I would again wish you the best of luck in proceeding, but I would urge you to caution. I would urge you to pause and 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 really think through your long-term goals in this, rather than it's a lower investment amount and there's nothing else in the room right now. So, Kailu, if I may add, I've always said to many of my clients that you have to define your goals correctly. You enter Absolutely. the EB5 program primarily to get the green card. Yep. And many of, many of you have other pursuits in life. So given those considerations, EB-5 is less taxing on your time and effort. Absolutely. And at the same time, it does come in the way of, you know, rate of return, like Kai mentioned. So these competing goals have to be very clearly articulated in your own minds. If I were 100%. one of you, I would say simply, my primary goal would be to get my green card. That's why I'm getting into this program in the first place. Secondarily, I would like to get some rate of return, but that's not going to be my primary consideration. But then like other panelists pointed out, it's possible some people are very entrepreneurial they want to combine these two things, but you'll continue to struggle going between these two goals. And then at the end of the day, you also want to come in and go out of this program in some discreet manner. So given all of these goals and given the extensive conversations I had with clients, I pretty much developed what the goal should be for most of you. And those are simple. Just make sure you get your green card. Second, make sure that you get some rate of return. And make sure in doing that, you choose the right regional center. Because that's an important issue. While I'm not endorsing any particular regional center, my experience tells me I've worked at CMB for a long time. And I, I'm truly, you know, grateful on behalf of my clients that CMB has literally made itself available through many of their friendly people, through people like me to at some level, they're very accessible and they've acted most importantly, very responsible toward my client. And I have a large base of clients from throughout the world. So CMB, my relationship with CMB if I may state, is not based on any pecuniary gain. In fact, I don't. I truly believe that CMB has been a good partner for many, many of my clients. And many of them are very happy that their journey started toward the US and many of them are in the middle of it. But all of them primarily are very happy that everything worked out as predicted, given that there are so many other intervening factors like the economy, et cetera, et cetera. But during the entire period, particularly the pandemic, they've been very forthcoming. They disclosed information. So this is beginning to appear like I'm endorsing CMB, but I'm not. I'm truly speaking to you from the bottom of my heart. This is my experience. I have nothing to gain in making this comment. Thank you, Mr. Kumar, for your generous words on CMB. And uh, based on my experience and from our mutual investors, I can testify to this that the accountability and the responsiveness is entirely mutual working with your law, with your firm. Um, Thank you. So I, for all panelists, I, I, I have a follow-up question on this direct EB-5 investment. I know you your, your inputs basically touched this point, but I, I still want to bring it out. Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a question. So, uh, Kyler, you mentioned that uh, more likely than not, 
um, you would bet your money on a, on a higher investment amount about program renewal. So if I'm a prospective family at the moment, and you also said the, the, the increase also will include the direct EB-5 investment, and it looks like not only the direct investment is our is my is option at the moment. This is also a five hundred thousand option. It's uh, so if I'm a prospective investor, should I think that uh, I will be better off to jump into the direct EB five now because that seems to be the last bus for five hundred thousand? Should I catch on that bus? Sure. And uh, will so will the direct EB five investment? Uh, investment amount be fixated as as five hundred thousand as other you know typical regional center offerings. Sure, um, I'll take a step back and we'll walk through an example if we can. I think I think that'll be helpful for all of us. Uh, and the, the example will be you know I'll, I'll stick with a restaurant, but it'll it'll apply to to many industries and particularly many industries where an entrepreneur is truly going to have an opportunity. Uh, Direct EB five investment. What makes what makes it a bit more of a risk? What makes it uh, a slimmer chance of success is truly the fact that if I want to operate a restaurant, I'm going to pick the best location where I can attract the most clients to come, the the most guests to come to my restaurant, to to eat the most delicious food. I'm going to hire the the best chefs that I can, the 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 best wait staff, the the best people that I can. If I'm restricted to EB-5, the government can now tell me you cannot operate in that location. Sorry, unless you're willing to put a million dollars in or, or whatever that dollar figure happens to turn into, unless you're willing to put in the increased investment amount, you can't, you can't put your restaurant there. So that, that's the first restriction, the first goal, location, 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 right? I'm now being told I can't pick my own location or I'm restricted to certain locations. That, that, that reduces my likelihood of having a successful restaurant. It makes me choose, do I want a successful business or a successful EB-5 pursuit? Second, I want to hire the best people that I can. Well, some of those people might only be able to work part-time. I can't hire a part-time individual. That doesn't count as my, as my 10 required employees. I want to work at my own restaurant. I'm, a, I'm an amazing chef. I cannot do that. That does not count toward my 10 employees. I wanna hire my, my, my spouse, my child, amazing uh, opportunity for, to teach my children the, the good values and work ethics that I, that I want to pass on. I cannot do that. The government is restricting me that I cannot hire those people. I can, I can hire them, but they don't count. I have to hire other people to meet that 10 employees requirement. Now, just looking at dollar figures, half a million dollars, if I'm hiring full-time employees, providing them with benefits, providing them with all of these other things, that's going to cost me, I'll say $50,000 a year. Even if I'm not paying salaried employees that amount, I'm still paying for benefits. I'm still, you know, and that doesn't take into consideration renting the building, paying for electricity and, and other utilities. But $50,000 a person, 10 people, that's $500,000. Am I really turning that significant of a profit that after the first year I have more money to, to funnel into this uh, wonderful entrepreneurial venture that I'm now restricted in location, in hiring practices, in, in everything else? Further, what happens three years down the road or two years or one year, year and a half down the road when I say, okay, my restaurant's doing okay, but I need to reduce my hours. I need to adjust things. I need, to, I need to let one of my wait staff go and get down to nine employees. I cannot do that. The US government is telling me, if you do that, you lose your green card. So when we, when we say that the difficulty of a direct EB-5 investment, it's not a matter of EB-5 direct is bad. It's just that goals of owning a business, goals of getting to the United States, they will they will conflict with each other. They they inevitably will conflict with each other. What a regional center does is it pads that conflict. It says, I don't have to tire 10 employees. I'm allowed to have indirect employees. I don't have to manage my business. I'm allowed to 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 invest, to serve as a limited partner in a partnership, to to monitor it at my at my leisure. 
and to and to go open my restaurant if I want to, to to pursue that business pursuit purely as a business pursuit rather than also as an EB five uh, pursuit, a, a pursuit of a green card. Um, so again, direct is not is not bad if you have the right opportunity and you're working with a great immigration attorney. If you're working, you know, and and understand the risks and rewards. And understand that conflict and have, have ways to, to counter uh, and to, to pad that, that inevitable conflict, a direct EB-5 investment is still not an awful idea, but it is riskier. It is harder. It is uh, a, a greater expectation, a, a greater understanding that the U.S. government is also going to have an opinion on the way you run your business. Is, is that truly what you want in, in, in opening your restaurant and having all the success in the world? I'd like to add to that because Kyler nailed it when he when he was talking about um, floor and and ceiling. We know what the floor is in the in the EB five right now for a direct, and that's sure. five hundred thousand. We have no idea what the ceiling will be. You're an equity participant. Equity is equity. That means not only can you lose everything, it means that you are the first one that will have to add more into the business to allow it to survive. That business and those jobs have to be last at minimum two years, and there's no ceiling. They can, it can continue to digest and to eat money at a rate that you hadn't anticipated. And if you're not able to fulfill that, then maybe the business will be gone. Maybe the opportunity will be gone, but simply because there was not enough to allow that uh, cash infusion, to allow that business to survive long enough to be profitable and long enough to sustain those jobs. So there's no idea in, in an EB-5 regional center, there, there may be a cash call, but the minimum investment amount, you never have to fulfill any cash call. The 500,000 is the 500,000 that's, uh, or 700 or 900, whatever the definition of the minimum investment amount, that's identified with a direct EB-5. It, you know what the minimum is, but you never know what the maximum is. You know, the, you. the whole concept of restaurants have been mentioned as one example. But let me say this to you. Obviously, U.S. is a country where you come and get your dreams accomplished. It's the American dream. So entrepreneurs are, are encouraged. But what happens is the confusion between the ability to come and stay here, not only for yourself, Many of my clients are concerned about their children going to school. So they're all coming within an age group. So there are a lot of multiple factors impacting on it. And restaurants notoriously, as somebody who has done an MBA from UCLA, I'll tell you, the failure rate of restaurants is the highest among all the restaurants. And the whole issue centers around what Guy Boyle said, which is, what risk are you willing to take? Because you are now taking not only a risk of making an investment in a business that may or may not succeed or may succeed very greatly, but if it fails, your green card also fails along with it. Now, the primary goal for which you entered into this program is in jeopardy. I have done this direct investment for over many, many years for many of my clients, all of them tend to be companies that are smaller and they just entirely depend on demand and supply, which is subject to market fluctuation. And so if you look at it on, on from a goals perspective, I go back to the, the center, central point I've been making, which is define your goals. Either you are a businessman and you want to enter into this program or you want to get a green card and you mix up these things, you're going to continue to struggle. Maybe you'll succeed, you'll come out of it successfully, but that's the risk that each one of you must think about and navigate that very carefully because life is also on a timeline. Your children's life is on a timeline. So you have to make a decision to say that look in a discrete timeline, I have to achieve certain objectives. And my primary objective is generally based on, I am sure that I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of immigrants. My primary objective is to accomplish the green card because 
I'm looking for more opportunities in the US, not just my own business. I'm willing to come in here. Once I get the green card, it opens up a great country with the most stable investment possibilities. So I truly believe that you guys have to really internalize some of these issues and come to a conclusion that you can live with. But I continue to emphasize the goals and from that perspective, I continue to say that for most of you, and also from a pragmatic point of view, the regional centers is the way to go. Thanks. We actually have a follow-up question. I think we, uh, the panelists have covered. So why the chances are slim for EB-5 direct investment? Why can't entrepreneur consider to combine both? Please share your experience. Um, so I think we did anything, cover, covered most yeah, of we, it. Yeah, I think that this question has been covered. It, it and it's possible that an entrepreneur could could combine both. It's just uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, risk and also conflicts between the between the way running the business and also the the immigration pursuit. Um, the the other related Ms. issue quickly is it is easily said than done when it comes to employment creation for small businesses. And just to take a look at restaurant business again as an example. It is very hard to sustain this. And it is very, very hard for most of the restaurants to begin with to compete. So it's very difficult to create jobs. This is just a practical perspective here. It's not such an easy effort given all the regulations within various states and the federal regulations governing employment and the immigration status verification process. When you put all this together to start your own business, the risk that you may be assessing may not be simply based on what you're used to in your own country. You are now exposed to a foreign country where all of these things play out in such a way that you'll begin to wonder, both from a cost perspective, from a point of view of practically running this business, from a cultural perspective, from a regulatory perspective, it certainly poses challenges. I'm beginning to sound like I'm really discouraging people. That's not what I'm saying. You know. I'm just being practical because I come myself from a country other than the US, even though I've lived here for a long time. I can articulate on behalf of all of you with some degree of clarity as to what you're, what you're thinking. I hope I'm relating to all of you. My advice continues to be, just keep the factor that your primary purpose is to obtain permanent residence and not get appended in a process that is unending and everything else is passing by. Uh, uh, Mr. Kumar, we uh, we have another question that is uh, somehow related with uh, with directly V five investment, but not not necessarily directly related. Uh, so from from attendee, this is from attendee. How long does it take to process EV five, and what's the first step? Is there any domain restrictions, or it could be any industry, or and could it be equipment investment? Ex such as expanding a transportation company? And is there a required set percentage share in an existing company in the, US, in the USA required by US CIS? This question is for you, Mr. Kumar. Yeah, it's a pretty complex question. I can spend an hour discussing this issue. Do you want me but to repeat it? Back to the timeline, Siha. First of all, when you process a green card, there are two two factors that you have to take into account. One is the processing time, and the other is the priority date. The processing time is a function of how long immigration takes to, to process an application form. And therein lies all the surprises. One can never tell, and it's a long process. So we have no control on it. It's not based on any objective factors simply the priorities or some bureaucrat sits on your application. 
So that is the processing time. Notoriously, it is the processing time that has been holding back cases as opposed to priority date for most of the countries that are participating in this program. In fact, for most of the countries more recently, the priority date is pretty much by the time you complete the approval of the initial application, it is pretty correct. So the, the holdup is really literally in the other area. And this again begins to intersect with so many other factors. So the answer to the question is that the priority date is based on demand and supply of the immigrant visa. Each country is, uh, has a ceiling of a certain percentage of immigrant visa that can be issued. The greater is the demand from those countries, the longer is the life that you have to wait. But that, as I said, has pretty much been, at least for most of you, not a major factor. The real factor has been processing time. So when you put all of this together, how long does it take for you to get a conditional green card, for example? My answer to that question is probably somewhere in the range of two to three years, minimally. Now it is also an inflection point for those people who are investing. You have to keep this employment going because it's not necessarily a statutory issue or a regulatory issue. Immigration bureaucrats are looking at, show me that you sustain 10, 10 jobs over a period of time. When it is centered around one individual company, it's much harder. And now you go into a piecemeal approach of putting some part-time jobs, some full-time jobs, the, the transactional cost of all this is very, very burdensome. So please keep these two lines. Processing time, I would say, is three years. And then after that, you have to be, apply for the removal of the conditional green card, which usually is a little shorter. But regardless, all of this has a certain degree of uncertainty, particularly right now. For example, somebody asked the question, what happens if the 485 is denied? What is the finite point? I mean, you know, if the Congress does not act, how long do this 485 sit there? Or how long does any of these initial applications just stay there? So it is my own feeling that too many complex factors have played into it recently, not the least of which is the pandemic. So my own take on it is that all of this, because it has become so long lasting delays, suddenly there will be some impact and all the cases will start getting approved quickly. And which is what is happening in employment based green cards right now, suddenly they're approving them. So who knows what is in store but the wait has been so long for many of us that I think it's going to move very quickly at some point. And unexpectedly, we'll get cases approved as quickly as you cannot even imagine by current standards. Did I answer the question, Sophia? I think so. I think, so. I think you, you, you uh, answered in most part of it. Um, we actually have Sophia, more questions. Sophia, you're but... tough. You're yes. not... Most part of it. Well, let me see what is the part that I have not covered. Um, I think there's a, a question about uh, about industry. Like I, um, so I think the attendee didn't specify that is for direct investment or or for for regional center. Um, I hope you can share some insights um, regarding what what's the industry restriction when when investors think about uh, EB five investment. The industry restrictions are also tied to the type of business you are in. For example, if you are in the business of chemical manufacturing, let's just give you an example. Or you are in pharmaceutical industry, or you are in some other business which is subject to a lot of licensure and regulations. You are now dealing with an industry that is going to place a lot of obstacles on your path. Whereas if you're dealing with the restaurant industry, you're dealing with factors which have a lot to do with the risk that you take and how many of them succeed, where you locate them, like 
one of the panelists said very correctly, the places where you want to locate your restaurant is not necessarily the place where the demand is. It usually centers around cities and suburbs. Having said that, the immigrant population is moving in certain areas with concentration. So if you're thinking of an ethnic restaurant, you will locate it there. So there are factors there that all of you are encouraged to, to really do your own research. At the end of the day, CMB or I cannot address these questions in a way that we are able to tell you what happens in each of the industries. All that we can tell you is the state where you operate, the regulations that make it burdensome and the nature of industry, all of them have a say in terms of where you really want to put your money and can, when you want to start your own business. I think I can help. As far as the regional centers are concerned, one of the good things is the regional centers are vetted. First of all, immigration is approving a regional center in the first place, followed by each of the projects that need an approval. So there are, the regional center is doing its own due diligence. All the investors who are investing money are doing their due diligence. Collectively, they are giving you a much more particularized timeline within the context of all that, all the actors who are involved in it. But suddenly you get a better framework to handle all of this with the regional centers. I can help a little bit with uh, with the question because you were mentioning Kumar about uh, regional centers, and I know that there had been in the market when the regional center program was alive that uh, that were promising an expedited processing based upon the the industry. There was one was a manufacturing concern. There was another one or two that were out there, and they for whatever reason they were they were marketing as though they were going to get a speedier processing of the I-526 petitions based upon uh, whatever criteria that they were, what they were marketing. And uh, we hadn't found that to be exactly correct. Um, even though there was a promise of that, the USCIS processes I-526 petitions as they process them. Uh, first it was uh, first in, first out, then it was based upon visa availability. And to be honest with you, I don't know that we could uh, see an uptick one way or another based upon visa availability for various countries um, based upon the the visa bulletin and availability and nor based upon uh, anything other than the, the normal processing times. Uh, we also had heard from the marketplace that some of the investors who had invested exclusively in those regional centers based upon the the marketing of their their economic sector or which whatever project was behind it they were complaining of the fact that oh I, I invested because i was going to get a speedy process of my i-526 petition and it and it just didn't happen so uh, the answer to the question i think goes back to um you know one should anticipate that that mr kumar was right somewhere between two and three years is on average uh, if it happens sooner than that be be excited but don't don't invest for the purposes. Uh, you know, look at a project and invest simply for the purpose that you think it's going to be a speedy process. Um, it, that's that's a mistake, and it's been borne out uh, time and time again by multiple investors over multiple projects, and um, uh, it's it's uh, something that is fraught with danger and high expectations that are they're often shot uh, shot down simply because it, it's not the way the USCIS does business. They they function at the speed of government not at the speed of business. So Kai, if I may add, when you're talking to people across the world, one of the things that I figured out is that immigration and their processing times largely are consistent, but then there are always outliers. And most of you will hear from somebody you know, or somebody you heard will tell you, oh, my case got approved in 20 days. That's true. There are isolated cases that get approved. Now, if you make that a basis, now you are simply depending on a bureaucracy mm -hmm. and some example some friend gave you, and the very same thing will turn around and become a major issue for you. 
So are there cases that they approve? Yes, absolutely. They expedited it. Nobody knows what the reason is. And these centers suddenly come out and say that we are able to get that. So buyers beware. Think about it, you know. Don't jump into this thing just because one or two friends of yours tell you. Notoriously, it is the friends who tell you something which is either an exception or it is simply a hearsay they heard from somebody else and there is no truth to it. We have many clients come to me and say, oh, my friend got it done within 20 days. He got his approval of the conditional green card. I tell them, tell me who it is. Tell me what the factors are. Mm -hmm. And the story suddenly becomes completely different. So therefore, don't go with the advice that friends give you. You can, but let it be simply a suggestion and not a way to make a decision because I truly am worried about it. For example, there was this whole concept of developing an, an Olympic village. That was one of the projects. You know, They were going to create some some stadium for horses. And that was one of the programs that suddenly they approved a few cases because they said that it is tied to a certain time period mandated by the federal government. And we want to quickly invest and approve these cases on an expedited basis. It lasted as long as it did not last, which was a very short span of life. So I would not really make these decisions based on outliers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kyler, uh, Kai, and Mr. Kumar. This has been a very insightful, insightful discussion. And, uh, and it's a lot of information regarding EB-5 for our attendees to, to digest. And now i like to uh, put this EB-5 topic aside and uh, invite, invite our special guest uh, here today, Mr. Jake Park, to share some information regarding a second platform of uh, CMB Regional Centers. Uh, a, a platform that provide investment opportunities for investors who are looking for re rate of return instead of uh, immigration. Uh, Jake, the floor is yours. Can you tell us about our, our investment platform that generates uh, a great return for the investors? Here's what, before, before we do that, I wanna brag on Jake a little bit. Um, he works for CMB, but his role really is in compliance and uh, his interface with uh, borrowers and um, with with ensuring that that mile markers are hit during construction periods, that's key to some of the protections that CMB has in our organization for investors. And I know this is a shameless uh, uh, advertising for for Jake and for CMB, but this is something where you know the direct EB five has has been talked about. And, and I think this draws a complete contrast between direct EB-5 and, and what CMB as a regional center does to protect our investors. And, and Jake is, is proof of that. He's, he's here in person and his entire role is to ensure that jobs are created based upon performance of our, our, in, our borrowers in the way that they function, the way that the money is utilized in the construction and expended making sure that they're in compliance with loan agreements. And so the financial, they hit financial targets and job creation targets. And so this is not something that you are going to find in a direct EB-5 investment. It just doesn't exist, but it does exist in, in the CMB regional center uh, structure. So I wanted to brag on Jake a little bit and, and to illustrate just how vital he is to protecting investors. And uh, his role is something that does not come along with a direct EB-5 investment. They don't exist in that way, uh, the way that they do with uh, the way that Jake is embodied here to, as a protector of the interest of the investors uh, from the CMB side. Thank you, Kai. Yeah, thanks, yes. Jake. So as part of the compliance team, one of my responsibilities is to track, monitor, and analyze the project and developers' financial reports to ensure that the borrower entity and the project is in compliance. Uh, we do receive and analyze borrower and project level financial statements, projects annual budget, cash flow pro projection, 
construction spending, uh, guarantor report, and the operation of the project and other reports as needed. And as Kai also mentioned, it, it is our first priority to make sure that the borrower entity and the project are in compliance as per loan agreement requirements because the project's construction and, the, and operation are strongly related to the safety of the investment itself. We do our job to deliver the best possible real estate investment offerings in the market with the lowest risk to our prospects by doing our proper due diligence. Keep monitoring, analyzing, and also forecasting the financial health of the project throughout the milestone. So for those who are interested in EB-5 program, it is always important to do your own due diligence in choosing right regional centers. Well, thanks, Jake, for your inputs regarding your role as a loan compliance associate. And Thank as you. I mentioned earlier, around the world, it is well known that the US is a great place to invest in. So we do have some interested investors who already completed their immigration or who are not looking for immigration. And they are simply looking for a rate of return by investing in the, in, in, in the US. And the CMB, at CMB, we have such a platform. So can you tell us something about the, the, such an investment platform, NHK Capital Partners? Sure. Uh, it is interesting, Sophia, that you mentioned many people want to tap into US real estate market. We did receive great interest and demand from single family rental partnership that we just closed in Dallas, Texas. So before I talk about the project, I would like to give you some background information on why and how the second investment platform, NHK Capital Partners has come into form. Thank you, Kai. Based on our management team's more than 20 years of experience in the real estate market, NHK Part Capital Partners is an investment platform for alternative investment opportunities to generate institutional level of return for indi individual investors. We are a trust-based company. Over 80% of NHK investors are CMB investors who reinvested their capital to NHK offerings after receiving money back from CMB. The company also provides its client, clients investment opportunities in US commercial real estate that are otherwise traditionally reserved for institutional investors. Typically, the annualized return on our partnerships are within the range of 14 to 20%. Can we go to the next slide, Kai? Thank you. CMB Regional Centers. As a recap, NHK Capital Partners is formulated based on our management team's experience with CMB Regional Centers. Our affiliate and another Hogan company, CMB Regional Centers, has raised over $3 billion US dollar in capital from foreign national investors seeking US permanent residency through the EB-5 program with 20 years investment underwriting experience. Our exp experienced staff has the insight of working with nearly 6,000 high net worth clients from over 100 countries. We have also provided funding for projects in various commercial real estate asset classes, including hospitality, logistics, residential and multifamily housing, student housing, office and mixed use, and renewable energy developments. Next slide, please. NHK Capital Partners has 
three fully subscribed projects. And the upcoming project for subscription is the Reserve Men's Field. The project is available for subscription in mid-October. The Reserve Men's Field is another detached single family rental property in the United States, which is a hot property at the moment, because as we all know, COVID-19 has reshaped and reformed people's preference in the living environment. The project is located in Mansfield, Texas, 30 minutes drive distance from Fort Worth and Dallas, which is fourth largest metropolitan statistical area in the US. The sponsor of this project is Stillwater Capital, which has collaborated with CMB on multiple EB-5 and NHK partnerships. We have a tremendous and spotless track record with this developer. The expected annual return in simple term is approximately 20%. And the target investment term is four years with the entry amount for this offering is the same as all other NHK offerings, which is 100,000 US dollar. So at the moment, we are receiving a lot of interest in this offering. If you are interested in this offering, please stay in contact with us. More details of project will become available in mid-October. We look forward to speaking more with you. Thank you, Jake, for sharing with us this uh, exci exciting investment opportunity with an annualized re expected return as 20%. Uh, we, I, I'm sure uh, many of our attendees here would love to hear more details about this offering. Um, sure. Well, tonight uh, it has been it has been an illuminating process and a discussion. And again, I like to express my gratitude to all the panelists here and also for all the attendees to take this Friday evening to, to, to be here, uh, hearing us out about the EB-5 program and also CMB's investment plan for NHK Capital Partners. Um, so i like to wrap up our webinar here. And Kai, do you have some final insights to put? I do, and, and I would also like to say thank you to the panelists and our, our attendees who joined today. The, uh, this is the beginning of a discussion. It isn't the end of the discussion. As uh, Mr. James has just, uh, let us know that things are evolving in EB-5, and as things evolve, one important thing to note that there are a lot of there's a, there's a lot of tendency for to be attracted at the next thing that comes into the marketplace or the next opportunity that comes along. Um, be patient. Do your due diligence. Do your homework. Um, we are strongly involved and in, in very very positive on the outlook of EB five being renewed. Uh, we looked at the program will have a, a long life and a long extension. Uh, there will also be some investor protections. Some of the things that CMB has been doing already will be mandated across the entire EB-5 industry. And uh, we think that's a very good thing to protect investors who are, are participating in EB-5, and including those that have already invested. The jobs are already created to allow them to go through the process and uh, live their dreams here in the United States, bring their families, and live the American dream. And, and uh, we look to be a part of that for today, tomorrow, and tomorrow's tomorrow. And and uh, we certainly would love to have you reach out to CMB with any questions, any additional questions that you might have regarding the EB-5 program, any changes and, and our current offerings when the Regional Center program uh, comes back. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, Kai, for your conclusion. And I, I want to apologize that I think we didn't finish all the questions because they were a little overrun on our time. Uh, however, the, the our contact information is on the screen now. So all of our attendees, if, uh, if you have any additional questions or any unaddressed questions, please uh, feel free to write us and we will, we will get them addressed uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. As part of the housekeeping, just so that you know, we will we will send out an email to all of our registrants, and the register that will include a link to the recording, 
If there are some of those unanswered questions that's, that, are, that remain unresolved, we'll also uh, add some Q&A, some of those questions and some responses to those questions in that, in that send out that'll be forthcoming in the next couple of days. So uh, for those who have registered, I look forward to your, your email inbox and we'll send a link to the recording as well as some of the responses to the unanswered questions. We'll also have a link to uh, NHK and how to get more information on that platform. Okay. Okay. I think and this is the end of our webinar. All right. Well, thanks to all that, that have joined us. Uh, Attorney Kumar, thank you very much for your time. It was five o'clock in the morning when you started, I, I think. And, and uh, you look, you look uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed, even though it was early in the morning and, and Kyler, I'll, uh, I'll leave you guys with a, a, a opportunity to, to add your last thoughts. Attorney Kumar. Yeah, I just thank you for your kind words. You know, once you get me started on immigration, I wake up very quickly and I was a little off center from, from the video. So I crave your indulgence, my apologies. Next time I'll try to center myself a lot better. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you all the panelists. It was very, very instructive and exciting conversation today. Thank you. Uh, Kyler? Uh, yeah. Um, so Mr. Kumar, I'll, I'll warn you, the sun is coming up finally. So uh, we, we have reached that point in the day. Uh, so you have that to look forward to. No, th thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar. Thank you. Uh, to the CMB team for putting this on. Thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, truly a, 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 an amazing time to be part of the EV5 program. Uh, look forward to, uh, to, to the positive uh, outcomes that we're all hoping for. Uh, continue to ma maintain that positivity. Uh, we are working for the best of the program for uh, the, the future for all of us. So look forward to it. All right. Thank you all and have a good day and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.